I'm honored to moderate session three in our second day together. My name is Anita Sinha, and I am an associate professor of law at American University, Washington College of Law in Washington, DC, United States. Um, this session has three papers with three co-authors ready to present with us today. I will introduce all the presenters up front. Um, each of author will have about 20 minutes. I will be keeping time, and I hate this part of the job, but I think of it as keeping the trains running. So um, you'll see a little, little timers here. Um, so we can have about 15, 20 minutes for a question and answer at the end. Okay, so in terms of introductions, first we'll hear from Ana Ballesteros Pena. She is a Marie Curie postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies at the University of Toronto and at the Faculty of Law at the University of Corinna. Her co, oh, so she, along with her co-author, Professor Kelly Hannah Maffet, um, have a paper that Anna's gonna to present today uh, called Risk in the Immigration Detention System in Canada. Next, we'll hear from Jonah Zifi, who may need to keep her um, video off to keep connected. So um, just be aware of that, um, who is a doctor's, doctoral student at the Center for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies at the University of Toronto and a junior fellow at Macy College. Uh, Jonah will present a paper that she has co-authored with Professor Audrey Macklin, The Role of Privatization in Canada's Immigration Detention Centers. And we will close with Professor David Moffat, who's a sociologist and assistant professor in the Department of Criminology at the University of Ottawa. David will present a paper he has co-authored with Suhil Benselman, uh, which is called, um, provocatively, when the state promotes, quote unquote, alternates, alternatives to immigration detention, co-optation, condition-based carciality, and abolitionist visions. So I'm looking forward to this panel. Anna, if you don't mind kicking us off. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. I am going to present uh, the paper which has changed. I'm going to share my skin, uh, my uh, screen, sorry, because the paper has uh, changed the title, but I think it's not a major issue. But uh, the paper uh, that we are going to present is called Paper Reality, the Agency of Documents in the Production of Risk and Migrant Subjectivities. So over the last decade, decades, a security-based risk, risk framework has informed the criminalization and illegalization of migrants and refugee claimants in Canada and elsewhere. International mobility policy frameworks are informed by an assemblage of national and international understandings of risk informed knowledges about the legitimate or illegitimate immigrant and the legitimate or illegitimate refugee. The entanglement of concepts such as crime, terrorism, national security, and danger to the public with migration policy narratives justifies a plethora of measures, practices, and technologies premise on mistrust, labeling everybody as a potential source of threat. The securitization of migration has resulted in the proliferation and legitimization of increasingly sophisticated and complex practices and techniques of detention in response to unwanted international mobility. So in our paper, we want to show the manner in which different subcategories of migrant subjects are performatively and documentarily produced and reproduced in the immigration detention system in Canada through the use of what we call the risk dispositive that includes but also goes far beyond risk assessment tools or notions of dangerousness. More specifically, we examine how illegalized subjects are evaluated through templated frames of risk need framework and then reconstructed using various uh, documentary processes. We try to analyze how data as compiling and shaped by, by various uh, documentary documents produce a way of knowing and governing reconstituted documented migrant subjectivities. I will go into more detail and explain all the concepts in a few minutes, but now I am going to offer a bit of a context and explain how risk is positioned in the Canadian immigration detention system. So the National Immigration Detention Framework was adopted in 2016 for the Canadian government to create a better fair immigration detention system that supports uh, the humane and dignified treatment of individuals while protecting public safety. 
authorities wanted to make sure that they have policies and processes in place founded in risk assessment and tolerance and that were consistent across the country. In this new framework, the improvement of risk assessment processes was a central component. So risk-based procedures, techniques, and rationales are not new in the Canadian context, but within the new framework, the formal and pervasive use of risk, not, not only in procedures and documents, but also in discourses and practices, has undergone an important leap. The detention of foreign nationals regulated by the law has been operationalized in a set of enforcement manuals periodically updated. Mentions to risk adopting different meanings are widespread all over the law and the manuals. Risk is used to guide detention, to determine guarantees, to prioritize deportations. It can relate to dangerous nets, to justify preventive measures to tackle what may occur in the future. Mental health and risk also interact very frequently under different factors, et cetera. Interestingly, in the court of the system is the fact that detention requires sensitive and balanced assessment of risk. Broadly speaking, uh, their main, uh, their, the main reasons used for detaining somebody uh, in Canada are for examination purposes on their entry to Canada, for identity reasons, the so-called fl flight risk, when the person is considered unlikely to appear for immigration proceedings, because the person is considered a danger to the public, and finally due to criminality and security concerns. In the moment of deciding, the officer, along with the reasons stated, must consider other aspects. Furthermore, alternatives can be, must be considered depending on the reasons of detention and the level of risk conferred. So I am not going to explain uh, the alternatives to detention because David is going to talk about it later on. But if the person is not offered an alternative to detention at the beginning, another risk assessment milestone takes place, the use of the national risk assessment for detention. Conversely to other tools for the, of the same nature, this tool has the only purpose to decide where a person will be detained. In Canada, immigrant uh, detainees can be confined either in an immigration holding center or in a provincial jail. Additionally, if the person is detained, there will be detention reviews 48 hours later, seven days, and every 30 days. So we, in our paper, we try to argue that risk is a multifa multifaceted dispositive for reproducing and expanding the subcategorization of irregular migrants and asylum seekers as a group that must be supervised, detained, and expelled. Foucault refers to a dispositive as a thoroughly heterogeneous ensemble consisting of discourses, institutions, architectural forms, regulatory, regulatory decisions, laws, administrative measures, scientific statements, et cetera, et cetera. Risk is a pervasive, dynamic, and encompassing concept that configures a system of discourses, tools, practices, practices and techniques that contribute to legitimize and reinforce the Canadian system of immigration detention. Within this framework, we will pay particular attention to the role of documents as mediators in the operation of this risk dispositive. And to do that, we draw on risk literature and particularly in novel performative approaches to the construction of penal subjects and on documentality research. So first, studies on risk technologies in the criminal justice system and immigration detention have consistently challenged the objectivity and accuracy of risk assessments. More recently, Robert Worth used a performative approach to analyze the assessment process to determine level of riskiness. Second, we use the literature, the literature on documentality. We focus on how documents shape subjectivities by incorporating the materiality of documents also as a significant part of this productive process that can produce as a kind of paper reality. Some authors pay attention to the generative capacity of documents that functions as mediators in social and political relationships, impacting legal subjectivities and existences. How we will apply this theoretical framework to our case study? We will try to unveil what we call the process of documented the undocumented subject, a documentary and performative process of producing subjectivities that relies on notion, notions of risk and dangerousness, risk informed knowledges, templated framings of risk need, and that has effects in the ways in which people are classified and governed within the system. But let's begin by explaining what we understand 
here by the undocumented migrant or refugee claimant because although it is linked with the use of the concept in migration and border studies, has here some nuances based on this documentary literature. So immigration and border studies, as well in policy documents and speeches, different doc concepts have been used to name those people on the move who cross borders or stay in a country without the documentations required by the immigration law. Some of, the, of these concepts are illegal migrants, irregular migrants, undocumented migrants, illegalized migrants, etc. All these expressions contain different nuances and particularly as scholars use them with, different, with particular purposes in order to emphasize several elements in their analysis. But the different concepts try to describe a situation in which a person lacks a temporary or permanent residency, the documents sh showing that they are uh, refugees or refugee claimants, etc. In this paper, we are going to add to this definition of the undocumented, the, ab the, un the absence of presence of identity documents such as passports, ID, birth certificates, or the fact that they are questioned by our authorities. And we will also frame the concept of the undocumented in direct connection with the materiality of these documents. And by doing this, we will show how, how the absence of presence of particular documents in different circumstances activate risk knowledges and meaning, meanings that start to reconstruct migrant subjectivities. So let's offer a couple of examples of, of, of what this concept uh, means. So a refugee claimant arriving at the airport, they might lack identity documents because they have destroyed them or the person is fleeing from their country of origin. This increases the level of suspiciousness in multiple ways. On the one hand, as the identity is not determined and until it is, this absence is a critical aspect in the production of the mig migrant risky subject. I don't know who you are, so you are a threat, a risk. But on the other hand, the assessment about the authenticity of the official documents can act in the same way, but in a twofold direction. First, because the identity is not established, but second, because this activates the already latent feeling, feeling of distrust. This feeling is sometimes aggravated by the fact that the person has already breaking the rules by using false documents or destroying them. Authorities understand that this behavior could happen again in the future under other circumstances, which le leads to an attitude of distrust. But let's th think as well in somebody who maybe was a permanent resident at some point due to a criminal offense, that is a critical point here, and I will come back uh, to the, this point later, lost the right to be legal in the country and maybe he doesn't have a passport. Birth certificate, they suspect the, documents, uh, the document is not authentic, he does not want to give it to the authorities or something similar. And the government tries to determine his her nationality and obtain a travel document, but it is not possible because the authorities of the alleged country of origin refuse to recognize him or her as citizen of their country. In these two examples, it is not only that the person does not have the documents required to be legally in the country, but also the material absence or the questioning of the documents activates these risk need frames. So from this moment, the authorities will try to document the person, and in this process, all the risk dispositive is mobilized. How does the process of reconstituting uh, the migration subject operate? So one main element that contributes to the production of risk subjects is the way in which documents are materially and symbolically used to build and reinforce the system of, of immigration detention. And I am referring here to the set of guidelines and orientation that have been used to operationalize immigration and refugee laws for years. The processes by which these documents cir circulate when they are used, the virtual sites where they are disseminated and the different steps follow and people involved in the revision serves as vehicles of imagination. That is the effect of these recurring actions performatively build the reality in which they will operate. So we see how the proliferation of this material based um, within a system that has been already rooted in a suspicious approach to non-citizens and that tries to be improved by the introducing of risk contributes to the production of this paper reality that run the system. This paper reality contributes to the leg legitimization of the system by self-justifying its mere existence. But the inputs of producing risk are pieces of documentation that constitute the evidence for the determination of the dangerousness of the person. Interestingly here, 
First, the quality of the evidence required in the migration process is significantly lower than the one used in other legal processes. Manuals offer a list of documents that can be used to obtain evidence. For example, regarding inadmissibility for criminality, one of the sources of evidence can be a testimony and or declarations of the person concerned or witnesses. Additionally, other potential sources listed as, uh, listed as documentary evidence includes media articles, scholarly journals, journals etc. During the fieldwork, we collected testimonies of situation in which a search on Google and a name coincident led, led to the detention and their allegations of danger to the public without any proof against the person. One of the prejudicial effects of the use of this grown evidence is the difficulties to prove the mistake when somebody is detained, sometimes without legal assistance, frequently without a family or social network. Additionally, even for a lawyer, it's frequently challenging to overturn the initial allegation, despite the poor evidence provided. Interestingly, conversely to other domains where the symbolic and productive power of documents is manifested because they fulfill some requirements, and this is what was conferred them productive powers, in this case is the opposite. Once again, the problem with the use of this documentary base for sustaining the case is the fact that, that its mere existence contributes to create distrust and to feed the image of the risky migrant that is always a potential, potential threat. One example is the person who is considered a high risk and instead of being detained in an immigration holding center is transferred to a provincial jail. Living in this facility can affect his mental health, so their daily life there will be determined by that, and he could spend time in solitary confinement, what can aggravate his condition. All of these actions are documented in the fight and will impact the decision making in the hearings. How is this initial documentation process reproduced over time? First, we will refer to the identity documents and to the monopolization of Western countries of the legitimate tools to, to, mobil to mobility. Sorry. A central aspect here, when we are talking about countries that might lack a standardized and bureaucratized system of official documents, and where, for instance, birth certificates do not exist or have not, not existed before, so there is no way to get them. This lack of documents can condemn those affected by this absent, frequently sub-Saharan racialized men to a vicious circus, circus in which the lack of identity prevent the authorities to release them the impossibility of getting documents is frequently interpreted as a lack of, co of cooperation, allegations of crimes, past criminality, place them in the highest level of the risky pyramid, and mental health issues prior to detention or that emerge while in detention maintains them confined for years. The detention hearings reiteratively represent a milestone in which the reproduction of the dangerous subject happens periodically. The circulation of the file and its growth sustain and perform, for, perform this productive power pro, process. Sorry. On the other, on the one hand, the more the file is expanded by previous decisions, the more difficult it is to modify that was previously decided. The cumulative force of the file, as one lawyer characterized it. On the other hand, in particular for lengthy pre detentions, the Canadian Border Service Agency has to show that something has been done to try to move things forward. This serves as well to increase documentary proofs and the material power of the file in producing subjectivities. However, once again, the quality of the evidence is an issue and there are other practices that can limit the circulation of documents. In some circumstances, CBSA acts blocking the circulation of documents and the lawyer don't have access to them in due course. Other times, the process is a delaying of the circulation. When the evidence consists in testimonies or conversation transferred to papers, there is no possibility of cross-examination. The actions and documents got to represent um, the truth against which, which is almost impossible to fight. And the need to prove that the CBSA, the Canadian Border Service Agency, is doing something and that ends up converting the process in, in a document trade in which Every practice is justified to achieve the goal. To conclude, the gender and racialized effects of the operationalization of risk informed policies and the documentation they produce reinforce pre existing categorizations of risky migrants. They are categorized as high risk and identify as such because they have particular risk factors such as past criminality, mental health, or exemplified problematic behavior. This status as high risk snares 
them in ongoing cyclical logics and bureaucratic and ex exclusionary processes that are difficult to overcome. They can be placed in detention indefinitely, making it difficult to reconstitute themselves as less risky, and thus are perpetually seen as non-cooperative as they attempt to resist inequitable and unfair processes. Either way, they remain in detention in high security prisons or live in the community under exceedingly strict supervision measures or with no path to citizenship or legal residency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, that was great. Um, so next, Jonna, are you ready? To yes, thank you. you. Um, so I, I will turn my camera off, but I will turn it back on afterwards. Um, just gonna... Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Um, okay, so in this presentation, Audrey and I addressed the expansion of privatization in the detention space, the use of private security firms to supervise and control detainees, uh, the delegation of confinement from federal immigration detention centers to provincial jails, and I guess since David will be speaking about ATDs, I'll very briefly touch upon this. So our goal is to caution against further privatization by documenting how current practices undermine transparency and public accountability to the detriment of the individuals under detention. So really quickly, the US war on drugs in the 80s generated overcrowding in prisons and skyrocketing costs, and the solution was seen to lie uh, with private entities that promised efficiency, quality, and lower costs. This momentum also influenced their proliferation of similar trends in immigration detention. And then declining crime rates and decarceration have also incentivized the companies that profit from imprisonment to shift their business strategy toward migrant detention. Ultimately, the practice has resulted in an unregulated shadow system of detention, weakened procedural protections, and widespread human rights abuses. The events of 9-11 also had an impact on the phenomenon of privatized securitization, which Deepa Fernandez has dubbed as the immigration industrial complex. And as with previous complexes, the creation of an undesirable other coupled with a rhetoric of fear creates popular support for government uh, spending to safeguard the nation. So in Canada, explicit privatization in the sector has not been far reaching, but the apprehension that Canada will enroll in the migration industrial complex is not without merit. So in addition to using private corporations for the design and construction of detention facilities, states, including Canada, are also turning to for-profit entities for what is being advertised as citizen services. So migration control functions that have traditionally been considered as duties of the state are delegated to a handful of private multinational corporations. And these duties include the management and enforcement of detention, processing of visa requests, though their involvement in the decision-making process does vary. Management of biometric databases, security and surveillance technologies, health and food services, and assistance with removals to states where it's too dangerous for immigration officers to escort deportees. So once a physical and technical infrastructure is set up in one state, these companies can then swiftly extend their services to other states with, with efficiency. It should be noted that states do not fully transfer ownership of its core functions, rather they transfer, transfer the responsibility of immigration functions to private actors. So as such, it institutionalizes the role of private actors in delivering government services. So in Canada, two examples of privatization stand out, carrier sanctions and the involvement of private actors in detention and deportations. I want to focus on the private security component, but just really briefly regarding carrier sanctions, by pushing the border outward, functionally the responsibility to screen migrants and manage threats of would-be asylum seekers has been outsourced to airline personnel who are neither trained um, and have to make this decision within minutes. So they're also not bound by legal norms of fairness or accountability, and their actions take place on the territory of other states, making recourse practically impossible, thus allowing states to evade their responsibilities for refugee protection. 
So while Canada was a pioneer of carrier sanctions, the US, UK and Australia surged ahead with fully privatized detention facilities. And the experience in this country has demonstrated that the for-profit centered model is characterized by poor training, a lack of access to fair asylum processes, inappropriate and inadequate service delivery, especially in relation to healthcare, substandard detention conditions and underreporting of violence. Um, uh, also the creation and exploitation of a captive labor force, which is predominant in um, detention centers in Libya and a blatant disregard for, for human rights. So the absence of accountability structures means their wrongdoing is rarely detected. And when it is, there's few consequences. So such contractual agreements augment state power while concealing human rights abuses and obscuring the state's responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the migrant. So in comparison, the role of private companies in Canada is relatively limited, but still lacks oversight. Uh, created in 2003, the authority to detect, prevent, and detain unauthorized migrants, as Anna mentioned, rests with the CBSA. So companies are hired through competitive procurement processes to construct facilities, provide security, and manage most day-to-day -day operational services under the supervision of CBSA. So for example, um, LEC Engineering Contracting won a $23.1 million tender to construct the recently finished Surrey facility in British Columbia. And another Montreal-based firm, LeMay, uh, has won the tender of over $5 million to construct the Laval Immigration Holding Center. So again, as Anna said, there's three immigration detention centers in Canada all of which are medium security. And otherwise uh, we make widespread use of provincial jails to house immigration detainees. Um, so with regard to IHCs, private security firms are contracted to manage these facilities under the instruction and guidance of CBSA officers. So uh, for example, Garda to Canada has been contracted to provide security for Quebec. Uh, for the year 2019 to 2021. And this contract uh, totaled over $18 million. In Vancouver, CBSA has contracted G4S security. And for the year 2019, 2020, the contract totaled $15.7 million. And similarly for Toronto, the CBSA renewed its contract with Corbell Management um, to manage a Toronto facility and support transportation and relocation of detainees until 2028. And this was for a total cost of $77.8 million. So the division of labor between CBSA and private security in the daily operation of these facilities remains opaque, but interviews and informal conversations have revealed that those held in IHCs are entirely in the hands of private security officers. CBSA officers act as a warden, are responsible for transfers between IHCs and jails, and conduct interviews with individuals who are being released on bonds. Uh, CBSA liaison officers are also available for administrative assistance a few days a week from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on site at provincial jails. And the recently established CBSA community liaison offices um, is responsible for coordinating alternatives to detention. But all internal day-to-day -day operations are entirely conducted by licensed private security guards uh, who are also responsible for conducting background checks and collecting biometrics. So the most notable criticism regarding such partnerships is the absence of meaningful oversight and accountability. CBSA is the sole federal law enforcement agency in Canada that has no dedicated independent review body mandated to investigate complaints, initiate inquiries, or take disciplinary action, even in the event of a detainee death. And internal processes that exist within CBSA are neither independent nor transparent. So the CBSA code of conduct actually emphasizes that when wrongdoing is suspected, officer's identity is protected. And even more poignant is the fact that CBSA contractors, including private security, are not subject to the code of conduct but instead, and I quote, are asked that they respect the spirit and intent of its requirements. So it's important to briefly situate detention in a larger immigration regime that I think Anna covered most of this. Um, so in Canada, detention can occur when reasonable grounds exist to believe a foreign national is suspected of being a flight risk, a danger to the public, their identity is not established or detention is required in order to complete an examination. 
a detainee can be placed in an IHC or a provincial jail. And unlike the decision related to a detainee's placement, CBSA decisions to detain are subject to an initial review after 48 hours, seven days, and 30 days thereafter. Unlike in the criminal justice system, adjudicators are only required to justify continued detention on a balance of probabilities and are not bound by any legal or technical rules of evidence. So this weakens procedural fairness, particularly for long-term detainees who are less likely to be released and are more likely to be held in carceral facilities. And as the 2019 Supreme Court decision in China emphasized, the Immigration Division has no explicit power to examine harsh or illegal conditions and the responsibility for the location and conditions of detention rests with the CBSA or provincial correctional authorities. So IHCs should always be the default facility for detention, uh, but this is not the case. So in reality, nearly a third of detainees, including those without criminal records and suffering from mental health issues, are consistently placed in correctional facilities. In 2019-2020, 68% of detainees were held in IHCs, 19 were held in provincial jails, and 13 were held in other non-IHC facilities, which include police cells and CBSA cells at ports of entry and inland uh, offices. So the vast majority of detainees are confined on grounds not related to public safety concerns. And since 2017, only about 5% of detainees were actually held on grounds of public safety. So in most instances, the decision on where detainees held is solely based on the risk assessment score assigned by a CBSA officer. And regardless of risk, migrants located outside of the geographical location serviced by an IHC are housed in a correctional facility. Uh, data we obtained through an access to information request demonstrated that approximately 81% of detainees in provincial jails are held for the purpose of completing an examination uh, as flight risks or to establish identity. And these also tend to be the detainees held for longer periods of time. Um, so the NRAD, updated in 2018, the NRAD form is intended to be a transparent and objective tool, uh, ensure consistency on detention placement. It replaced open-ended questions, which were frequently left blank uh, by introducing a point scale based on nine factors, eight pertaining to risk and one to vulnerability. Uh, we received a redacted copy of the form as part of this research. And though an explanation for the numerical points uh, is not publicly available. The form does provide a breakdown for each category, albeit with no explanation of how risk is assessed. So I won't go into too much detail, but each factor allocates points and the total score determines where a detainee will be held. Uh, the risk factors are added and the vulnerability factor is subtracted. So the risk factors are associated with the detention grounds. However, the form is used when one is already detained. Uh, so the model presents a clear bias in favor of punitive conditions it, because it depends on one's past criminal background to predict future dangerousness. Uh, I know Stephanie is on the call and she's also written about this um, recently. So a, a score of zero does not exempt one from detention. It simply labels them as low risk. So CBSA maintains their discretion. <laughs> okay. Um, Provincial jails. So though not a true instance of privatization insofar as provincial jails are public institutions, we argue that it is a part of an internal reconfiguration of government's role in migrant detention. And note that the motive and mode of these intergovernmental arrangements are not dissimilar from contractual agreements between public and private entities. So first, the federal provincial deals are profit-driven commercial arrangements. They're managed through memorandums of understanding. And secondly, they are regulated through mechanisms that are not public or transparent. So currently, um, I guess additionally, the, the arrangements operationalize the, the literal resort to criminalization of detention by permitting confinement in penal institutions. Um, so the CBSA has a bilateral agreement to house immigration detainees in prisons or in jails uh, with the provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec, and is in the process of negotiating ones with other provinces. Detainees outside of these provinces are also held in correctional institutions, but CBSA does not clarify what kind of agreements it has in place with these provinces. 
So these contracts closely resemble the public-private par partnerships the CBSA has with private security firms regarding I I IHCs. Uh, the CBSA pays their provinces a per diem rate to incarcerate detainees, and this rate differs between each carceral facility. Um, but the 2015 MOU with Ontario, which is the only one we've been able to view, uh, states that the rate shall be the average of the per diem rates for all of Ontario's correctional institutions. The CBSA also pays their province an additional premium equivalent to 20% of the daily rate to cover administration and overhead costs related to accommodation. So in 2013, these are the, the most recent figures we could get, the cost per immigration detainees in jails was $259 per day compared to 196 per day per inmate. Uh, the most recent MOUs were negotiated in 2018. And like I said, there's no publicly available information, um, but the average cost of incarcerating an inmate has increased. So we infer that the cost of housing an immigration detainee has also increased proportionately. Uh, so again, in 2013, the CBSA paid the provinces over $26 million to detain migrants in jails. And over 80% of this was paid to Ontario where the majority of detainees are held. So though provincial jails are public institutions, their relationship with CBSA is governed by contracts uh, that mimic the contractual relationship that CBSA has with wholly private actors. It's impossible to deny that immigration detention is punitive when migrants are incarcerated in prisons and governed in exactly the same manner as offenders convicted of a criminal offense. There's only really two differences. First, offenders serve a determinate sentence after which they must be released. Whereas migrants in detention never know if or when they will be released or removed and are not subject to the same procedural safeguards. And secondly, both provincial corrections and federal immigration authorities disavow accountability for misconduct and abuse of migrants in, detained in jail. The province denies jurisdiction over migrants because they are detained under the authority of a federal statute. While the federal government denies accountability because conditions of confinement are governed by provincial law. So while the excuse for unaccountability is jurisdiction rather than privatization, the net effect is similar. Okay, so alternatives. Um, so these are new measures that were introduced in 2018 and include a community case management supervision program uh, a national voice reporting program and an electronic monitoring program. So the multiplicity of actors in the field of detention goes beyond sub-state governments and private companies. It also includes private citizens and NGOs who become enrolled in the system as sureties or bonds person for detainees, uh, thereby assuming the responsibility of monitoring and surveilling non-citizens from detention on conditions. So here the motive is less about profit than avoidance of financial loss. Uh, the CCMS program comprises the John Howard Society of Canada, the Toronto Bail Program and the Salvation Army and is intended for individuals who do not have a bonds person or who require community support. Uh, each of these organizations have a contract with the CBSA and they're very secretive about it. Um, the TBB has become the only real alternative for migrants who have been in long-term detention or who have mental health conditions because CBSA mistrusts other bonds persons. Um, their contract does have a caseload limit, though this has changed in light of COVID. Um, so the voice reporting program is geared towards low to medium risk individuals and available at inland enforcement offices. Anecdotal evidence suggests it has been a complete failure, but I'm happy to chat more about it during the Q&A. And then really quickly, the electronic monitoring program is a pilot um, that is confined to the GTA and is operated through an MOU with Correctional Services of Canada, which is responsible for the management of the technology. It is built upon real-time location data and is intended as an add-on condition for high-risk individuals. Though again, uh, we did some interviews and in practice, this has not exactly been the case. Um, so enrollment consists of an ankle bracelet monitor and radio frequency modem at their residence. So the use of surveillance technologies was motivated by the opposition to long-term detention, yet such electronic shackles, as it was called yesterday as well, further enmeshed migrants in Canada's carceral system. 
So indeed, since the EM pilot began in Toronto, a request to utilize surveillance technologies as part of release conditions, predominantly in Quebec, have increased uh, at the expense of less invasive and coercive options. So I guess that the involvement of this party, this third party private actors in managing and policing the most vulnerable migrants imports high tech surveillance into alternatives to detention. And similar to the NRAD form, these tools restrict the liberty of non-citizens by assessing uncertainty, thereby legitimizing and normalizing assumptions of risk and the fear that non-citizens are a danger to the public or that they will disappear once released. Okay, so in conclusion, the, these relationships demonstrate a, a multifaceted and nuanced understanding of power, authority, and state responsibility. And while the reliance on private actors is often understood as diminishing the reach of the state, uh, in the context of immigration detention, it is argued that the encouraging of entrepreneurs to develop new forms of sanctioning has actually drawn the state ever more deeply into the management of social control. So these mechanisms of privatization and jurisdictional gaming share in common the effect of exacerbating rights violations under conditions that make non-citizens less visible and the state less accountable. Thank you. I don't know how I did on time. You were perfect. All of you so far are perfect. Um, I'm used to more of a, a verbose legal <laughs> lawyers people. So you guys are awesome. Um, okay, and so last but definitely not least, David. All right, um, so I'm assuming you can see the screen. Uh, thank you to Anna for organizing. Um, I'm happy to join you uh, here from Ottawa, from unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin and Anishinaabeg uh, territory to present uh, an excerpt of the longer paper that I've submitted um, uh, in the database or in, um, on the online file that was co-authored with uh, Suhel Ben Sliman to continue our conversation about what we've written in the past on the, the punitive dimension of uh, conditions of release. Um, so I retitled this, uh, when the state promotes alternatives to detention, what uh, al uh, access to information documents suggest about Canada's new ATD program, just you know, to, to shrink a little bit the argument and present you with what we've uh, found so far. So, um, one, one part of the argument is that a number of activists, researchers, and policymakers have been promoting alternatives to detention as a pos po positive reformist project for years with the idea of ending immigration detention, uh, but it's been co-opted by states uh, that are presenting them as a human solution. And while we acknowledge that these alternative in some cases may be less bad than detention and, and preferred when you have bad choices, uh, option between two bad choices, we argue that states adoption and co-optation of the language and practice of alternatives should lead us to move away from supporting this uh, strategy, not only the state's version, but the language of alternatives and insisting that these are not alternatives. Um, so in our paper, we look uh, at the Canada Border Services Agency's new alternative to the intention program that was just uh, presented, and we analyze it as a as a co-optation strategy aimed at neutralizing abolitionist calls to end immigration detention, which have really been the most vocal calls uh, in the 2010s in Canada. Uh, the organizing has been around ending immigration detention, and, and this has been presented as the response. Um, we also analyze uh, condition release as, and the alternatives as, as condition-based carcerality that has a punitive dimension to it that actually further expands the, the penal and carceral landscape at the topic of, of the conversation. So the ATD program is Canada is new. Um, uh, as my colleagues were saying, it, you know, it started in 2018. There's not a lot of data to work with, especially because the 2020 data uh, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic is, is not indicative of, of trends. Um, so what we've been doing is filing access to information requests. We have obtained uh, some from public safety. We have obtained also pre-released uh, documents. We're still waiting on our big A tip from 15 months ago from the CBSA uh, on the first two years of the implementation of the program. Uh, but I'll present you bits and pieces of, of what we think are interesting things that we find in, in the ATIPS document so far. So 
uh, very quickly, the alternatives to detention program, uh, as it's been explained, it, it was part of the uh, national immigration detention framework uh, that was, uh, and we can see this in the document, a response to pressure. Uh, there are some document where, you know, it uh, briefs for media brief for Ralph Goodell, the former minister of public safety, uh, that say, you know, CBS has been criticized about debt in custody, about the detention of children, about the use of provincial jails alternative to detention, you should say, are gonna fix this. So it is a response to pressure, that's a good thing, uh, but then it's also a co-optation, right? So this uh, national immigration detention framework included the ATD initiative, uh, directives to limit the detention of children in 2017 that had an impact, and also a lot of money to build uh, new and better detention uh, centers. Um, so again, as was just uh, presented, um, the uh, ATD program was officially launched in 2018, uh, but the document, uh, the CBS acknowledges that they've been working on it for a long time, since 2014, um, and put forward these expanded alternative electronic monitoring, uh, voice reporting, and community case management and, and supervision. So I'm not gonna really uh, go into the details of, of how they work uh, since uh, the, the work has been done for me, thank you. Uh, I don't have to present this, uh, but basically we all know that uh, from existing research in other contexts, Mary Busworth had done a lit review a few years ago of all that uh, the literature that exists. It very, very rarely uh, decreases detention. It very rarely decreases the length of detention except when there's specific uh, you know, direct directives, for instance, around, around children that say you should not detain children, uh, almost never. Uh, otherwise, it, it is unlikely to have an impact. Um, and we also find indication of this in, in the ATEP document um, um, because the numbers don't add up of what they promised to do. So in... Um, in a, a technical brief that was given the same week of, of the announcement of the program by Cal Desmarais, CBSA's Director of Detention, Transformation and Program Management. Uh, he starts by reassuring uh, the public, uh, I'm assuming, that uh, alternative to detention have always been used, right? Uh, so uh, he tells us, and this also appears in, in, uh, in speaking notes for the minister, uh, that CBSA officers have always used alternatives to detention in the, pack, in the past. In fact, thousands of individuals are released on alternatives to detention on an annual basis. However, programming has historically been directed to lower risk individuals. Thousands of individual is vague. Uh, uh, we could not verify uh, this information. Perhaps some of my colleagues have the information, uh, but that would be the case before. And he's telling us that after the objective, is that the CBSA anticipates to be able over time, uh, that over time up to 10% of individuals in detention may be released to ATD. Now, if, if those two information are true, and, and I'm not sure about this, uh, it's not a statistical improvement. In fact, it, it's less than what happened before, right? Because uh, if you do the average of the fiscal year 2012-13 to 2017-18, it's 7,412 people on average each year that spend some time at some point in detention. So 1,000 individual uh, was already 13.5. If it's 1,000 plural, we're at 27. Uh, so obviously this, this, these are very vague numbers, uh, but the objective that is announced by CBSA at the moment of launching this, their objective is actually at least uh, you know, we, we know that it's actually not uh, something, um, uh, you know, it's, it's something that is a tremendous change. They have very humble ambition with this, while at the same time telling us that it will uh, solve the problem of lengthy immigration detention. And this is not surprising um, because the, the, the language of risk uh, has not changed or not changed for the better. Uh, my colleagues have said that it has changed. So Carl Desmarais says, Alternatives are to be considered in every case. However, only individuals whose risk can be effectively mitigated in the community and who are cooperative with the immigration process are deemed suitable for programming. Cooperative individuals are defined as those who are willing to accept the conditions imposed upon them, which may include regular reporting 
and do not attempt to thwart progress in the immigration continuum. The CBSA continue to, continues to hold public safety as one of the most important consideration. So what does that mean in the context, uh, like it's been presented before, that in 2018, 2000, 2019, 2018, and really every year in the last decade, uh, 2018, 2019, 83.7% of those who spend some time in detention were detained because the officer had reasonable ground to believe that they will not appear. And the proportion is similar, right? So this suggests that in over 80% of the cases, the officer believes that the detainee are not cooperative individual, that they may attempt to thwart progress in the immigration continuum. So if this is our problem, um, it's very hard to imagine uh, if, if the condition to be released on an ATD is to not thwart the immigration system. To me, this says that they have reasonable ground to believe that, that you would, right? Um, so there's no real transformation, positive transformation of the risk assessment. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Stephanie and, um, and, and Kelly and Jonah have, have talked about this, uh, but unless there's a change there, uh, we won't see uh, an improvement and more people uh, being released, uh, I don't think. And in fact, if you look at 2018, 2019, and, and you add up, you know, all of those numbers, there's actually an increase of people being detained. There is no decrease in the length of detention, really. Uh, those are separate by categories, right? But there doesn't seem to be a decrease. And more people are detained in, uh, in immigration detention center than in provincial jails. Uh, and those are supposed to be the higher risk individuals. So it doesn't release more higher risk people. 2020 is an exception. It's hard to know where we're going, but what this points to is not promising. Um, now to take uh, each of those uh, alternatives, I'm, I'm not really going to go back over the concerns that have already been raised, um, but what we found interesting in, um, in, in, in our data. So, you know, as it was said, electronic, electronic monitoring is designed for high risk individual as an extra condition of release. Um, and implies the geolocation uh, through an ankle bracelet. Um, it is a true mem memorandum of understanding with Correctional Services of Canada. So on the one hand, we say we want to decrease the use of provincial jails, but we want to increase the reliance on, uh, on, the, on, on, on CAC. Um, there is, you, you know this, and, and Carolina talked about this yesterday, extensive research on detrimental psychological, social, and economic impact. Um, but one thing, and, and, and this adds to, uh, to what uh, Jonah was saying, uh, it's a creeping pilot project because uh, it was started as a pilot project for two years. We were promised two years only in the Great Toronto area with strict program parameters with the objective to acquire quantitative and qual qualitative data about the effectiveness of EM monitoring in the immigration context. If this is successful, the pilot project report is positive, then we move forward. But obviously, uh, it's been creeping in very fast. So under the guise of humane decarceration during the, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, activists, journalists have, uh, uh, have released the fact that migrants were released from uh, the Quebec, uh, the Laval uh, in, in the province of Quebec Immigration Detention Center uh, through, as a temporary measures to uh, this uh, EM uh, bracelet before uh, the end of the pilot project. So I found a way, uh, and I'll tell you about this weird backdoor, but to talk to the national lead program. Um, and he, I said, what's up with that? And the email, he answers, well, yeah, the EM pilot was originally extended into the Quebec region as per contingency planning based on as assess needs related to the pandemic. Operations have since been maintained in the region as an additional ATD community supervision, not really community supervision, but measure for detained individual, not solely on COVID requirement. Application of EM in the Quebec region strengthens our data capture for final program evaluation purposes. As such, it will be kept in place for the remainder of the pilot phase up until March 31st, 2022. So it's been extended by two years. Uh, that's why we haven't seen the report. Now it includes Quebec. That was not part of what uh, was announced and was part of the deal. Um, voice reporting. 
Uh, so, you know, there are other concerns about, about this program, but those are, are things that, that trends that we're seeing with the little uh, data that we have. Uh, voice reporting, um, um, you know, it's, it's been deemed a failure. Uh, the CBSA lists a voice recording as a program that's eligible for individuals that present a low risk of not appearing or a low risk of not appearing if they have another condition. Uh, individuals who would previously have been suitable for in-person reporting to the CBS. So this is an alternative that applies to people that could already be released, either without conditions or with in-person reporting. It, it's true that, the, the, and we've documented with Suhel, um, uh, the, you know, the burden of having to travel to the CBS office, pay the bus ticket, not being able to do other things and to report in person uh, is, is, is heavy. This might alleviate this, we don't know, but it's at least to me, unsure whether they can choose the alternative between in-person reporting um, and, um, and VR. Um, there's a number of issues, um, concerns with this technology, but one that's frequently uh, mentioned in the literature is that it would be unreliable. Um, and it appears that the CBSA accepts that. Um, so there's a, the contract was signed with uh, Connex telecommunication, a Canadian company that offers, no kidding, smart solution to complex problem. Um, and um, and the a statement of work says that the voice biometric engine must be able to identify the voice of an individual with an accuracy of 60% or more with a pre-registered voice print. And they would do three uh, recording, three samples of bio, biometric sample when calling uh, to compensate for that. Another interesting thing in the contract is that uh, this voice biometric engine uh, should support specifically those languages, English, Spanish, Arabic, Hungarian, French, Mandarin, Urdu, Cantonese, Turkish, Tamil, Punjabi, and et cetera. So those are targeted. Um, and so that, that raises a number of concern about racialized biometric surveillance. Um, there's no proof of that, but it raises concern for us specifically about the use of this data for accent uh, recognition, uh, either for the identification of the very asylum seeker, for instance, or person facing deportation that's underneath that. We know in the case of uh, Michael Mvogo, for instance, expert in dialogue and accent, uh, you know, would interview him to identify where he's from based on his accent. Uh, Melanie Griffiths has done research on this in the UK. So there's a risk here that this can be used for that. Um, and certainly there is a racialized biometric dimension of this surveillance, right? Um, finally, the, the community case management and supervision uh, program, there's really little in the ATIP that we have uh, so far. Um, at the same time, it's the one alternative that, uh, at least in Toronto, has been existed for 15 years, right? The immigration bail program uh, of the TBP has ex existed since 1996. What is new is the expansion uh, uh, of this model to other locations, as, uh, as my colleagues were explaining. Um, and one thing is that, at least in criminology, people, people concern about uh, um, remand, about getting people out of jail uh, uh, in a criminal justice system waiting for trial, uh, as have, have tended to be supportive of the Toronto Bail Program because it allows for people to be released, uh, people who have mental health issues, people who might have not have a bonds person, would not be able to have a cash bond. Um, but the reality, so that's, that might be is a good thing. It's people that would not be released otherwise. At the same time, and, and there is some programming and some support. At the same time, uh, uh, previous research by Edwards in, in 2011 on the um, immigration aspect based on an interview with the, with the director of TBP shown that the conditions imposed by TBP are very stringent. Um, what was documented is uh, report of two times a week at first of reporting can be reduced later. There could be phone reporting, proofs of uh, participation in imposed programming, uh, proof of address, uh, living at the address that's been agreed upon, have to do something productive that is permitted under the uh, immigration law. So if you don't have a work permit, that means working for free. Uh, that's also the case of conditions uh, imposed by the CBSA without the, the TBP. That's something that Suhel and I have analyzed based on, on this condition in this previous uh, paper um, and have to cooperate with the TBP and immigration procedures, facilitate document for removal and so on. Um, so 
there's no firewall between the CBSA and the TBP. Uh, it's been a critique. They work very closely together. Um, it, it is a criminal justice model. So there's not even the advantage of a third party that would be, uh, that, that would be a firewall, right? It is a privatization, uh, you know, through NGOs and, and so on um, of, um, of the surveillance uh, within uh, within the community. So there are some programming that might be interesting, but it is really not an alternative. And it looks a lot like the same type of supervision that the CBSA does, except uh, more intensive. Um, so in, oops, in the paper, uh, what we're trying to do, um, and, and the paper is not gonna go ahead until we finally get uh, what we're thinking is the important, um, uh, the important uh, uh, A tip that we've been working on and trying to get for a year and a half. Uh, we're trying to frame ATD as co-optation of the discourse of alternative, as what uh, abolitionist Matthewson call a neutralizing technique to silence calls for abolition that were actually central to the work on immigration detention in the last decade, uh, as an expansion of racialized condition-based carcerality. It is not an alternative to detention. It is an alternative form of extramurals detention. It is detention. I think we need to say uh, that it is detention. Um, and we're arguing um, that we, we, sh we should, maybe it was a good idea sometimes ago to promote alternatives to say there are alternatives. I think we need to scrap that and really call for uh, an anti-immigration detention as a practical solution. At the same time, being pragmatic, we can leverage the existence of ATD to further delegitimize uh, in Tramuro's detention. Um, and, and we need to send, center non-conditional release, apart from promise to appear, as the reference. Everything that is not non-conditional release uh, is an alternative to release. And, and if we need to reshift re this, because those are not alternative to detention, they are, as uh, Holper has said recently, alternative to release. Release is the uh, only real uh, alternative. So thank you. That's it for us uh, with 30 seconds late here. That is absolutely fine. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much, Anna, Jonah, and David. Um, so I have the wonderful responsibility of um, keeping the Q&A. Um, while people are thinking about their questions, I just want to say that for me, it was so great to hear the Canadian context. I mean, for us in the United States, you know, over 70% of our migrant detention facilities are run by private for-profit prison corporations, including all of the recent children and family um, detention facilities. Um, and it's, you know, it's become increasingly problematic. And then ADD, ATD definitely has been co-opted here in the United States insofar as the ankle bracelets or electronic shackles have been now um, in the hands of private prison corporations. So they've been profiting. So they moved from the um, brick and mortar to the ankle bracelets and other alternatives, quote unquote. So we feel that very deeply here. Um, and I was very interested to hear about the voice reporting. I mean, I, I'm troubled to hear all the um, possible problems with it, but you know, especially under the former administration, uh, people had deep risk of capture if, as they were um, required to do the in-person immigration check-ins. So that was very fascinating. Um, and then the documentation part, you know, we just recently last month had an uh, asylum interview where um, our client had to, we wound up filing over a 600 page <laughs> asylum application. We can do that because we're a resource clinic. And, um, you know, you're talking more in the risk assessment part, but even in the, in the asylum context, right, as asylum laws become harder and harder um, to gain protection in the United States, the documentation part has been increasingly so. So that was very fascinating, Anna. Um, do folks have